Maddie, and today I'm looking through all of these toys. This one is my favourite. It's a spinning top. What's your favourite toy? The other thing I like to play with is this train set. It's really fun. It's got tracks, people, and even houses. But first, I need to put it together. Ta-da! But no train set is complete without a train. And every train needs a carriage. What happened there? Shall we see it again? Let's add some more carriages. Blue one. Green one. Did you see how the carriages attach together? That's because of magnets. These little silver dots, those are the magnets. And when you put the carriages together, they stick, which means you can pull the train around the track like this. Oh. Whee, under the bridge. <laughs> and when you're finished playing with the train, you just pull the carriages apart and the magnets become unstuck like this. But do you know how magnets work? Let's find out. How does it work? A magnet. Magnets are made of metal and they're really fun to play with. Look what happens when you put two magnets together like this. It feels like they're pulling towards each other until eventually, snap, they pull together. Did you hear the snap sound the magnets made? But look what happens if I turn this carriage the other way round and use this magnet instead. No matter how hard I try to push them together, they just don't want to connect. This time it feels like they're pushing away from each other. Why does this happen? On the end of each train carriage are magnets. They look the same but are actually different. Every magnet has two sides called poles. One side is called the North Pole and the other side is called the South Pole. And the whole magnet is surrounded by an invisible area called a magnetic field. When a North Pole magnet goes into the magnetic field of a South Pole magnet, they're pulled together. But when you turn them around so that the South Poles face each other, the magnetic field pushes them away. And the same happens if all the North Poles face each other. Only the opposites. A North and a South Pole will pull the magnets together. So although the magnets look the same, they're not. And it's only when the opposite, the North and South Pole, are put near each other, do you feel the pulling and snap, they come together. If you turn the magnet the other way round, so the poles are the same, instead, you feel the magnets pushing away from each other. Oh, and look, it's actually moving the train all by itself. So that pulling you feel is the magnetic field around the magnet starting to work. And this is called a magnetic force. But to show you how strong a magnetic force can really be, I've got some other magnets to show you. Here I've got two magnets. This one has North and South Pole clearly marked. North is the red side and South is the blue side. I've also got this little silver magnet, but I don't know which side is which. But there's one way we can find out. Did you see that? 
the two magnets pulled together. So that means this side of the silver magnet must be south because south and north poles will pull together. But it all happened really quickly, didn't it? I filmed this in super slow motion. Take a look. Look, as the magnets get close to each other, the magnetic fields start to work, pulling the opposite poles together. These little silver magnets are actually really strong. Now watch what happens when I run the north and south pole magnet over the top. Whoa! It looks like magic, doesn't it? That is so much fun. That's amazing. The magnetic force is so strong, it's making the little silver magnets jump high in the air to stick to the North Pole. I loved seeing how magnets worked. What was your favourite bit? Do you remember what you call the two ends of the magnet? That's right, they're called the North Pole and the South Pole. Did you hear the sound the magnets made when they came together? It was a big snap. And did you see the way the magnets jumped up high in the air when the North and South Poles were pulled together? I finished with my train set, so it's time to put it away in the toy box. But look, here is Teddy. Hello, Teddy. Do you have a teddy bear? Oh, they're lovely and soft, aren't they? But do you know how a teddy bear is made? Let's find out. How is it made? A teddy bear. Well, I'm here in a big teddy bear shop. Just look how many teddy bears there are. There are lots of different types of teddy bear. Today we're going to see how a teddy bear, just like this one, is made. Hello, Teddy. <laughs> and making a teddy bear all starts with the fur. This teddy's fur is made from something called mohair, which comes from a goat, a type of goat called an angora goat. <laughs> Next to the teddy bear shop is the teddy bear factory. And these are all the rolls of mohair. There are so many different colors. This is Ian, and Ian's going to cut out the shape of the new teddy bears in the mohair using this big machine. Ian uses a different cutter for each part of the teddy bear, and he's starting with the teddy bear's heads. It's like a giant set of biscuit cutters, and he uses the big machine as a press. Here we are, and look. Can you see the little holes here and here? That's where the teddy bear's eyes are going to go. Next, Ian cuts out some teddy bear bodies. And then he cuts out some arms and legs. Because each teddy bear has two arms and two legs, Ian puts one layer of mohair on top of the other so that when he starts cutting, he gets two of everything. So this will become two teddy bear legs. When all the pieces have been cut out, they're taken to the next part of the factory, the sewing area. This lady here is sewing the teddy bear arms and legs, and that lady is sewing the teddy bear heads. All of these pieces have been sewn. We have arms, legs, and a body. But can you see that the fur is on the inside? That's because teddy bear parts are sewn inside out so that when they're turned the right way out, all of the stitching is hidden. So the next stage is for all of these pieces to be turned the right way out. And look at this arm now. The fur is on the outside and the stitching is hidden on the inside. So we have two arms, two legs and a body, but there's one part missing. Do you know what it is? That's right, it's the head. But before the head is turned the right way out, it needs a pair of eyes. The eyes are made of plastic and just look at all of them here. Don't they look funny staring back at us? 
Each eye is popped through the small hole in the teddy bear's head, and then Sharon uses a special tool to pick up a bit of plastic called a washer, and then she uses the tool to push the washer over the eye, and it fixes it in place. And now, if we turn this teddy's head the right way round, you can see the eyes. It's beginning to look like a teddy bear, isn't it? But all of these parts are really flat. This wouldn't make a very cuddly teddy bear, would it? But that's because they need to be stuffed. All of this white fuzzy material is teddy bear stuffing, and it's made from something called polyester. Let's use my special camera to take a closer look. But where is my special camera? Oh, here it is. This is a microscope, and it helps us to see really, really tiny things. This is what the polyester stuffing looks like in close up. Look at that, you can see all of the little hairs, can't you? It feels really soft, but actually, under the microscope, the little hairs look quite wiry. Looks a bit like noodles, doesn't it? But how do we get this stuffing inside a teddy bear? the sound the stuffing machine is making. It sounds like a balloon being blown up. And here we have one stuffed teddy leg. It feels nice and squishy now. So we have the flat body, stuffed arms, legs and head. But before all of these can be joined together, something really clever happens. And that's because these teddy bears have something called joints. You have joints in your body. You have joints at the top of your arms, called shoulders, and joints at the top of your legs, called hips. And they mean you can move like this. And our teddy is going to have arms and legs, which can move in the same way. The teddy bear joints are made with long pins, which are sewn into the head, arms and legs. The pins are then attached to the body and fixed into place. Then it's time to fill up the body with stuffing. And here's Teddy. But he's got a hole in his back and he's missing his nose and his mouth. All of these get sewn over here. There we go. Much better. Now the fur is given a good brush, then it's time for a trim and no teddy bear leaves the factory without a ribbon. <gasps> there we go, Teddy. Looking good. One last important check. Yes, you are lovely and cuddly. I really loved seeing how a teddy bear was made. What was your favourite bit? Do you remember what the teddy's fur is made of? That's right, it's mohair. Did you hear the sound of the stuffing machine made when it filled the teddy up? And did you see what the stuffing looked like close up when I used my special camera? So the next time you play with a teddy bear, you'll know how lots of teddies are made and how they get to be so cuddly. And now you know how magnets work and how they stick the carriages of a toy train together. Right, Teddy, it's time we're off. I'll see you next time. There are lots of things all around, lots of exciting things that surround us. But how does it work? Do you know? How is it made? Do you know? Things that go up, things that go down, things that go pop. And today I'm out and about doing some shopping. Do you like to go shopping? This shopping centre is full of shops. 
but some of them are on the floor below and some of them are on the floor above. And there's a clever way to help people get up and down. Do you know what this is? That's right, it's an escalator, a moving set of stairs. But do you know how an escalator works? Let's find out. How does it work? An escalator. Have you ever been on an escalator? I'm going to take this one to get to the floor below. And to get on an escalator safely, you have to wait for a step to appear, hold onto the handrail, and then quickly step on. Let's go. see that I'm stood still but I'm somehow moving. That's because the escalator is moving downwards and it's carrying me to the floor below. You should never play on an escalator but I've got special permission to take a closer look. Can you see how the steps just disappear here at this metal yellow edge? It looks a bit like a comb doesn't it? The steps go underneath and disappear. But where do they go and where do the steps come from? Well, to find out, we need to look inside and underneath an escalator. Inside an escalator, the stairs are linked together in one big loop. It moves round and round. The stairs are attached to two sets of wheels called gears, one at the top and one at the bottom. The gears at the top of the escalator are called round bike chains. They look a bit like a bike chain. The gears at the bottom run along a track like a train. The gears have teeth on them, and when they turn, they pull the loaded stairs around with them. Each step has small wheels on it. When a step reaches the top, the chain pulls the wheels around the gear until the step is flat again. It stays flat until it gets all the way back to the bottom, ready to go round again. Aren't escalators interesting? This is an escalator workshop, and we've got special permission to be here so that we can see what the underneath of a real-life working escalator looks like. I'm going to use my special camera and a light to look underneath the escalator and see what we can find. Let's start by reminding ourselves what the steps actually look like. The curved bit is the side of the step, and then the flat bit is the top. But now let's move underneath. This escalator is switched off, so I can safely put my camera underneath. Here you can see the underside of the steps that you stand on. Can you see the curved side and the flat bit on top? And if we can see even further underneath, here, that is where the steps are lying flat, ready to make their way back to the gear to be looped around. So we need to see the gear, don't we? And this is the gear at the top of the escalator. It looks a bit like a giant bike chain, doesn't it? This escalator is set to move people downwards, so the gear will pull the steps all the way around from their flat position underneath to their shape as a step we can stand on. I want to see what this escalator looks like when it's working, so I'm going to put two special cameras underneath and then we can turn it on. Let's go. The first one will help us see the underside of the stairs as they move along. The second camera will help us see the big gear at the top in action. Right, the cameras are in place. I'm stood well away from the escalator, so it's time to turn it on. Whoa! And there it goes! Did you hear that? That was the sound of the gear kicking into action and it's beginning to pull the steps around. But I think it sounds a bit like a spaceship taking off. So you can see how the steps are being spun around the gear. They start off flat and then they unfold and become the shape of a step. Escalators can go in two directions. They can go down or they can go up. This escalator is going down, but shall we see it move the other way? <laughs> there it 
there's the sound of the spaceship again. So this time the steps are moving upwards. This time they start as a set and then they get pulled around the gear and they move all the way down underneath the escalator to the gear at the bottom. Amazing. What was your favourite bit about seeing how an escalator worked? Do you remember what you call the two big wheels that pulled the steps around? That's right, they're called gears. Did you hear the sound the gears made when they started moving? And did you see the way the steps get flipped upside down and turn the right way up when they come back round the loop again? So the next time you see an escalator like this or go on one yourself, you'll know just how it works and what's going on underneath. Escalators are great for helping us move up and down inside a building, but sometimes we need to move heavy things around. There's something really useful that helps us to move things around outside. Do you know what it is? That's right, it's a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrows have a great big wheel at the front, two handles and a large container called a pan. It makes it really easy for me to move all of this from one place to another. And then when I'm ready, I can tip up the wheelbarrow and pour it all out. Wheelbarrows are really useful, but do you know how they're made? Let's find out. How is it made? A wheelbarrow. This is a wheelbarrow factory, and inside are lots of robots. All these robots are making different parts of a wheelbarrow. It's like they're doing some kind of dance, isn't it? But not everything is made by robots. People and robots have to work together. When a wheelbarrow is made, it starts off like this, as a sheet of metal called steel. Steel is really strong, and it's used to make all sorts of things, like bridges, cars, even pots and pans. First, the sheet of steel is fed into this machine. A huge weight presses down on the sheet and folds it around a mould. When the metal comes out the other end, it's starting to look a little bit like a wheelbarrow. And now it's time for the robots. This robot picks up the pan and passes it to another machine. It cuts around the side of the pan. The robot then collects the bits that are left over. It's a little bit like the bits of leftover pastry from when you use a pastry cutter. I love all these yellow robots and watching the way they pick up the metal pan and swing it to the next machine. They know exactly when to pick it up and where to put it. The pan is put in this machine which makes four holes in it. These holes will be used to attach the wheels and handlebars later on. In here are lots of long poles. They're made of steel too, and they're going to become the wheelbarrow's handles. But how does something long and straight become two handles? Well, that's thanks to some more robots. And they're very noisy. The first robot bends the ends of the pole to make a small curved shape. Then it bends the whole thing in the middle to make a larger curve. And you end up with something like this. It's a funny shape, isn't it? But if you hold it in this position, you can see it's a pair of handlebars. I'm going to put one of my special cameras on the robot to see what it's like when it's working. Here goes. The robot is programmed like a computer to know exactly what to do. Look how that robot arm picks up the handle and knows exactly where to put it. Let's see what happens next. 
To connect all the bits of our wheelbarrow together, we need to use these. They're called fittings and they help fit things together. But we need to attach these to our handlebars. Come with me and I'll show you how they do it. called welding and it's a special way of attaching two pieces of metal together. That white spark is really really hot and it melts the metal so that they glue to one another. Whoa! With all those sparks flying around I have to stand well back. Look how bright that is! Can you see it sparkles? It's like a firework. It sounds like a firework too doesn't it? It's time for the finishing touches and the wheelbarrow handles are going to be given a coat of paint inside this machine. And here they are coming out the other side. They've been sprayed with a powdered grey paint. But before it's finished, they go into the oven. The oven bakes the paint so it goes shiny. Here they come. Don't they look shiny and new? Ready? be fitted together but we're still missing one thing can you guess what all these wheelbarrows are missing it's a wheel and it needs to be fixed to the wheelbarrow let's see how it's done the handlebars are fixed to the pan by putting bolts through the holes that the robot made earlier next the wheel is attached using a fitting and there we have it a brand new shiny wheelbarrow. What was your favourite bit about seeing how a wheelbarrow was made? Do you remember what you call the metal that the wheelbarrow was made from? That's right, it's steel. <laughs> Did you hear the sound the welding made? And did you see my special camera when I put it on the robot? We got to see everything the robot sees when it's busy working. So the next time you see a wheelbarrow, you'll know just how it's made. And when you go on an escalator, you'll know how it works and how it carries people from one place to another. Right, I'm off to do some gardening. So from me and the robots, see you next time. There are lots of things all around Lots of exciting things that surround us But how does it work? Do you know? How is it made? Do you know? Things that go up, things that go down Things that go up, things that go round With special cameras to show you Maddie, and today I'm going for a drive in the car. Off we go. Do you travel in a car? I really like to walk places, but when I need to go somewhere that's far away, the car will get me there quickly. There are lots of buttoned knobs and levers inside cars and this is a steering wheel. When I turn it, the car turns too. And can you see down by my feet, there are some pedals and this one is called the accelerator. When I press it, the car goes faster. But if I want to stop or slow down, I press this pedal. It's called the brake. Shall we see them working? Let's take a look. <laughs> But how do car brakes stop the car? 
do you know how car brakes work? Let's find out. How does it work? A car brake. <laughs> to see how car brakes work, I've come to a garage. A garage is a place you come to if a car needs to be checked or fixed. Have you ever been to a garage before? This is one of the car's wheels. This is the tyre and the metal bit in the middle is called the rim. But if you look through the rim, can you see there's another metal disc? That is part of the car's brakes, but we can't see it very well, can we? I've got an idea. Paul is a mechanic and he's going to help show us the car's brakes. The car is being lifted on this special lift. This is how mechanics get under a car to safely fix things when they go wrong. Listen to the sound of it. It's noisy, isn't it? And it must be really strong to lift an entire car. It's very high up, isn't it? Now the car is high up, we can get a better look at the brakes. You should never play in a garage or around cars, but I've got special permission to go underneath the car with my special camera. Wow! So this is what the underneath of a car looks like. This is amazing. You never usually get to see this, do you? Look at all of the cables and bits of pipe. But if we come to the front, we're looking for the brakes. And here is one of the car wheels. And this bit is the tire. But if you look inside the wheel, can you see that metal circle? That is called the brake disc. And then if you look just here, can you see that piece of metal? That is called a caliper. And the caliper fits either side of the brake disc. And inside the caliper, there are two things called brake pads. So the brake pads, the caliper and the brake disc all make the car slow down and stop. But to find out how the brakes work, we need to look inside the car. When a car is moving, the wheels on the car turn round. Behind each wheel is a metal circle called a brake disc. This goes round at the same speed as the wheel. To make the car slow down, the driver presses the brake pedal inside the car with their foot. The brake pedal moves a lever, which pushes against a metal cylinder with springs inside it. As the springs are squeezed, a special liquid called brake fluid is released. The brake fluid travels down a pipe to the wheel, and it flows into the caliper. This pushes the brake pads onto the brake disc and slows it down until the wheels and the car stop moving. So that's how brakes work. The mechanic has taken the car wheel off for us. So now we can clearly see the brake disc, the caliper and the brake pads. But I've got some other brake pads for us to get a close look at. These are brake pads. One of them is new and one of them is old. Do you know how we can tell which is which? Well, look at the size difference. This is the old one and it's much, much thinner. That's because as it's been used over time, it's worn away. Let's take a closer look at the surface of the brake pads using my special camera. This is a microscope and it lets us see very small things in close detail. So let's have a look at the new brake pad. Ah, can you see the surface is rough? It looks like lots of little stones, almost like a road, doesn't it? And it's this rough surface that presses against the side of the brake disc, which slows down and stops our car. But now let's take a look at the old brake pad. This one is shiny and smooth where it's been used and worn down. Because it's shiny and smooth, it won't slow the brake disc down as quickly as the pad with the rough surface. It would be slippery. We want our brake pads to have a rough surface like this. 
I loved seeing how car brakes work. What was your favourite bit? Do you remember the name of the metal circle that spins around next to the car's wheel? That's right, it's the brake disc. Did you hear the sound the lift made when the car was lifted up so we could see underneath it? And did you see what the brake pads looked like when I used my special camera? Fantastic! So now you know how car brakes make a car stop. There are lots of different types of car, aren't there? If you look around me, there are all sorts. They come in different colours, some are big and some are small. But do you know how cars are made? Let's find out. How is it made? A car. To find out how a car is made, I've come here to a huge car factory. Every car here starts off as one of these. A big roll of metal called steel. The rolls of steel are loaded into a machine called a decoiler. It rolls the steel out and flattens it. It's then cut into squares called blanks inside this machine. Listen to the sound it makes. It sounds like a train going over tracks. Each blank goes through this machine. It's called a press. Inside, a heavy weight pushes down on the flat piece of metal to give it the shape of a car part. It's a bit like a very heavy stamp. But do you know what car parts these are going to be? Can you see? It's a car door. As well as car doors, the press cuts out bonnets, that's the front of the car, car roofs, and the long pieces that make the sides of the car. So many parts! Amazing, isn't it? And all these cut-out car parts are called panels. When the panels are ready, they're taken to the next area of the factory called the body shop. The body shop is huge and this is where all the different parts of the car come together. But can you see that as well as production workers, there are lots and lots of robots. There is so much going on inside the body shop. I'm going to use my special camera to catch as much action as possible. Are you ready? Let's go. These robots are putting on the sides of the car. And these robots are doing something called welding, where they use very hot metal as glue to stick the panels together. The sparks look great, don't they? And these robots check the car over before it's sent on to the next stage. When all the panels have been attached together, you get this. It's called the shell. It's really beginning to look like a car, isn't it? Next, the car shell has to be painted a colour. But first, it gets dipped in this big tank of liquid, which protects the car from the weather. When metal isn't protected from weather, like rain or snow, it goes rusty. Like these nails. They look brown and mucky, don't they? And we wouldn't want our car to look like that. After the cars have been dipped, these robots coat them with a layer of paint called primer. Next, the car is sprayed with a top coat of paint. Can you guess what colour this car is going to be? This car is silver and it looks lovely and shiny, doesn't it? But the car is still just a shell. What do you think is missing? This is 
is the bottom part of the car and it's called the buck. The buck is made up of the engine and the brakes. But where did all the shells go? The shell is lowered down onto the buck and the two parts of the car are fixed together. This part of the factory is called the General Assembly Line and it's where the production workers put the car together. First, they put in the dashboard. The dashboard is the bit at the front of the car where there are lots of buttons and dials. Then, it's time for the seats. The wheels are fitted. And, don't forget the steering wheel. Finally, the cars are tested to make sure they're set to drive. And here it is, one finished car ready to be driven away. What was your favourite bit about seeing how a car is made? Do you remember the name of the metal used to make the cars? That's right, it's steel. Did you hear the sound the machine made when it cut the steel into shapes? And did you see the car being dipped into a big tank to protect it from rusting? So the next time you see a car or go for a ride in one, you'll know how it's made. And now you know how car brakes work. I'll see you next time. There are lots of things all around. Lots of exciting things that surround us. But how does it work? Do you know? How is it made? Do you know? Things that go up, things that go down. Things that go up, things that go round. With special cameras to show you inside. It's going to be a big surprise. I'm Maddie, and today I'm tidying my bedroom for having a much needed sort out. Do you tidy your bedroom? It always looks much better after a sort out, doesn't it? Right, now let's tackle the wardrobe. It's good to sort your clothes out every now and then. I don't know about you, but I often forget what I've got. Like this hoodie. I forgot I had it. And it's one of my favorites. I love the color and it's really cozy. All you have to do is zip it up. Like that. You've probably got some clothes with zips on too. You can get zips on all sorts of things, like your coat, or your shoes, or even your school bag. They're really clever, aren't they? The way they join two pieces of material together. But do you know how a zip works? Let's find out. How does it work? A zip. I love the sound a zip makes when you open and close it. Listen carefully. <laughs> now, if you look closely at my zip on both sides, you can see that all the way from top to bottom are these little bumps. These bumps are called teeth. Now, if I undo my zip, can you see at the bottom on this side, there are two metal bits. These are called sliders, and that's because they slide up and down and they have a pull tab on them so you've got something to hold on to. Now if you look at the bottom on this side of the zip there isn't a slider there's just this plastic bit it's called the pin. To do the zip up you need to take the pin and slide it through the slider into this slot. When it's securely locked in place you can hold the pull tab and pull the zip up and I'm in. To undo the zip all you need to do is pull the pull tab down all the way to the bottom and it pulls the two sides apart. Brilliant, so that's how you open and close a zip. But how does it work? How do the teeth lock together? 
To show you that, we need to look inside the slider. Each side of the zip has a row of teeth with gaps in between. When the two sides of the zip are lined up, the teeth on one side are opposite the gaps on the other side. To close the zip, the slider is pulled down to the bottom and the pin is put inside it. Inside the slider, there are two bits called wedges with grooves in them. One wedge is higher than the other. The teeth of the zip fit into the grooves of the wedges and when the slider is pulled up, it presses one row of teeth on top of the other row of teeth. This makes the teeth lock together tightly. When the slider is pulled down, the teeth are pulled apart from each other and the zip is opened. It's really clever, isn't it? Right, this is a special microscope camera. It lets us see really small things in close detail, like our zip. I wanna see if we can see those teeth locking together. This could be a bit fiddly, but let's give it a go. <gasps> we can see it working. You can see the teeth disappearing into the metal slider. Should we try it a bit faster? Ready? Downwards this time. Down we go. And now we can see the slider is unlocking those little teeth and opening the zip. I tell you what, let's do the zip back up again and get a close-up of the teeth zipped together. And actually, when you see them in close-up like this, they look like bits of jigsaw puzzle, don't they? It's amazing how when you make small things look bigger, how different they look. What did you like most about seeing how a zip works? Do you remember the name of the piece you pull up to close the two sides of the zip together? That's right, it's called the slider. Did you hear the sound the zip made when I opened and closed it really fast? <laughs> and did you see how the teeth of the zip were pressed together by the slider? So the next time you use a zip, you'll know just how it works with all those little teeth locking together inside the slider. I really do love this hoodie, especially because of the picture on the back. Fun, isn't it? Do you have any clothes with a picture on? Maybe it's a tractor, your favourite animal or a fairy. But do you know how a picture like this gets onto your clothes? Do you know how it's made? Let's find out. How is it made? It's green printed t-shirt. This is a workshop and the team here do something called screen printing. Screen printing is the type of printing used to put pictures on clothes for us to wear. Let's see how a screen printed t-shirt is made. The first thing we need to do is choose the picture we want to put on our t-shirt. How about a dinosaur? I love dinosaurs. I think a dinosaur would be great on a t-shirt. This is George and he's going to print out the outline of our dinosaur picture in black ink onto this clear film. It's a bit like printing something from your computer at home. Look, our dinosaur has been printed in black ink. But how does our brilliant dinosaur get onto a t-shirt? For the next step, we need one of these. It's called a screen. Can you see there are lots of tiny, tiny holes all over the screen? This material is called mesh, and those tiny holes let the ink for our picture pass through the screen and go onto our t-shirt. But at the moment, there are holes all over the screen, so if we try to put ink on our t-shirt, we'd just get one big square. To print our dinosaur onto a t-shirt, we need to make a dinosaur shape stencil on the screen. Stenciling is when you paint through the holes of a shape onto something beneath. 
life. Have you used a stencil before? Maybe at school, nursery or at home? To make the stencil, Barry puts a layer of special paint called emulsion all over the screen. This emulsion blocks all of the tiny holes in the mesh. Can you see that all the tiny holes have been blocked so you can't see through anymore? And no ink would be able to get through. Next, we need to make the shape of the dinosaur on the emulsion. To do that, the dinosaur image is put onto a very special machine with a bright light. Then, the screen goes on top. The light will make the emulsion go hard everywhere, except the lines of our dinosaur. It only takes a few seconds to work, but you can't see anything yet because the screen needs to be washed first. The emulsion that wasn't hardened by the light stayed soft, which meant it could be washed away by the pressure washer. Let's take a look and see what happened. Ah, look! So, all of that washing has revealed the dinosaur stencil. To show you where the emulsion has been hardened by the bright light and has blocked off all those tiny holes in the mesh, I'm going to use my special camera. This is a microscope. It helps us to see very small things in detail. So let's put the microscope on the blue bits of the screen. This is where the emulsion has blocked up the holes. And if you see, you can't see through it, can you? All you can see is blue. But if I move it over to the dinosaur's eye where the emulsion was washed away, look, you can now see those tiny holes in the mesh. So when we put ink on the screen, the ink will go through the holes, but won't be able to go through the blue bits. And this is how we have made a stencil. Our screen with the dinosaur stencil has been placed in this machine. It's called a carousel because it goes round and round. But now it's time for the really fun bit. Barry now puts the coloured ink in our stencil frame. Can you see what colour it is? It's green. Now the t-shirt is in place. Barry is going to use one of these. This tool is called a squeegee. It's a great word, isn't it? With the squeegee, he squeezes the ink from the bottom of the screen all the way to the top. And this pushes the green ink through all those little holes in our dinosaur stencil. It's a really good sound, isn't it? But what do you think is gonna happen when he lifts the screen back up again? A dinosaur t-shirt. That's amazing. The great thing about it is you can use the screen again and again to make more t-shirts. Our t-shirt looks great, but it's not quite ready for me to wear yet. The ink is still wet. So what do you think happens next? Our t-shirt goes into a special drying machine until the ink is set and dry. This is called curing. Once the t-shirt has been cured, the pattern won't rub off and it won't wash off in the washing machine either. So there's only one thing left to do, try it on. What did you like most about seeing our dinosaur being screen printed? Do you remember the name of the material which the ink goes through with lots of little holes in it? That's right, it's called mesh. Did you hear the sound the squeegee made as Barry pulled it from the top to the bottom of the screen? And did you see how the stencil looked on my special camera? You could see all the little holes which the ink went through. Ta-da!
ta-da, my brand new dinosaur t-shirt. What do you think? So now you know how pictures get put on t-shirts and you know how zips work. So you can tell all your friends and family how the little teeth pull together inside the slider. Right, it's time for me to go home. So I'll see you next time. I'm Maddie, and today I'm getting ready for a birthday party. Have you been to a birthday party? They're really fun, aren't they? Birthdays can be celebrated in lots of different ways. You might play fun birthday games, or sing birthday songs, or eat special food. But there's something else you might find at a birthday party. Can you guess what it is? That's right, it's a cake. One of my favourites is called Victoria sponge. I love all of the jam and cream inside it. And these bits are called sponge. Sponge is made from lots of different ingredients like milk, flour, butter, eggs and sugar. But do you know how sponge becomes thick, lovely and bouncy just like this? How does a cake work? Let's find out. How does it work? Mm, a cake. To show you how a cake works, I'm going to bake a cake for the party. Now I need to mix all of our ingredients together in a big bowl. In goes the sugar with the flour, and then the butter. And now for the fun bit, cracking the eggs. And the milk. Oh, and we mustn't forget this. This is called baking powder, and it's a special ingredient that will make sure our cake rises in the oven. Now we need to mix all our ingredients together. And for that, we need an electric whisk. Watch this. Because it works really quickly, it's going to put lots of air bubbles into the mix. Listen to the sound of the electric whisk. It's like an aeroplane taking off. Okay, have a look in my bowl now. Can you see that all of the different ingredients have been mixed together into a smooth, runny mixture? just pouring our mixture into two cake moulds ready to go into a hot oven. The oven is hot. You should never go near a hot oven yourself. Always ask a grown-up to do it. When cake mix goes into a hot oven, it starts to bake. It will rise and get bigger and bigger and turn into a tasty sponge. But to find out how, we need to get a closer look. When the ingredients are mixed together, they start to change. This is called a chemical reaction. First, the baking powder and the milk start to react together, making bubbles of air. The air bubbles are surrounded by a layer of fat from the butter, which traps them inside the mixture. Then, when the mixture goes into the oven, the hot air inside makes the egg whites surround each bubble and go hard. This protects the bubbles so that they don't burst. As the mixture heats up more, the trapped air bubbles start to get bigger. As they grow, the flour in the mixture around them starts to stretch. It stretches and stretches until it can't stretch anymore. And by then, the cake is ready. It's really clever, isn't it? My cake takes 20 minutes to bake, so I'm going to use my special camera to do something called a time-lapse. 
This means we can film something that takes a long time, but when we watch it back, we can see it happening really quickly. Right, the camera is in place, so we've got to wait 20 minutes until the cake is ready. You can see how the cake mixture is very flat to start. And now, watch. Look how the cake is growing. I think it's ready. Perfect. Sponge number one. And sponge number two. The sponge has got so much bigger and they smell fantastic. Look, they've risen by about this much. That's three centimetres. Now I just need to add the finishing touches to our cake. I loved seeing how cake works. What was your favourite bit? Do you remember the special ingredient that made the cake rise when it reacted to the milk? It's baking powder. Did you hear the sound of the electric whisk? And did you see the way the cake rose in the oven? So now you know how a cake works and you know all about the special chemical reaction that happens inside the cake and how the air bubbles make the cake rise. And if we cut into the cake, you'll see that the air bubbles are still there and that's what makes the sponge nice and fluffy. Can you see all of the little air bubbles? This cake looks like it's going to be yummy. I love having parties at my house, but you can have parties in lots of different places. In the garden, in a park, a swimming pool. I can think of another place you might have a party. Do you know what it is? It's a soft play centre. Brilliant! <laughs> I like crawling through the rollers and running through the tubes. And playing in the ball pool! But do you know how all of these things in a soft play centre are made? Let's find out! How is it made? Soft play. To find out, I've come here to a soft play factory. <laughs> they make lots of soft play items here. They come in different shapes and sizes, lots of different bright colours and, of course, they're all soft, even the floor. Let's see how they make the floor. Like all the soft play items made here, the floor pads start off with this. It's a material called PVC. It's really shiny, isn't it? This is Sarah, and she's going to cut out all the pieces we need to make a floor pad. She starts by drawing a big square on the PVC. This will be the top of the floor pad. The square is then cut out. Listen to the sound of the scissors. Next, Sarah cuts out the bottom of the floor pad. And then the sides. Once all the pieces have been cut out, they need to be sewn together. And that happens here. Maria is going to use a sewing machine to sew all the pieces together. Maria is sewing the floor pad inside out. She does this so when it's turned the right way out, all of the stitches are hidden and it looks lovely and neat. The zip here is where the filling is going to go inside. It's a bit like a bigger version of a cushion cover on a sofa. To make the floor pad soft and squishy, the skin is filled with a material called foam. There are lots of different types of foam, but this is the foam that they use for a floor pad. Can you see that when I squeeze it, it's soft and squishy? Let's use my special microscope camera to get a closer look at the foam. Whoa, look at that. That is incredible. Can you see that there are lots and lots of tiny gaps? Well, those gaps are 
actually bubbles of air. And it's the air that makes the foam soft and squishy, so it's safe to play and jump around on. Before the foam can be put in the cover, Colin turns it the right way round. Look, now all the seams are hidden inside, and the edges look really neat. Now the foam can go inside the cover. The foam has to reach every little corner, but Colin makes it look easy. Brilliant, all zipped up, and here we have one finished floor pad. But a soft play centre needs more than just floor pads. This is a parrot you can sit and rock on like this. It's really fun, isn't it? Shall we see how the parrot's made? Let's find out. The rocking parrot is made with the same PVC material. The only difference is that this time, Sarah is going to use a template. This is a template. Can you see it's the same shape as the rocking parrot? The template is placed onto the material and Sarah draws around it with a pencil. She then uses a tool called a scalpel to carefully cut out the shape. So, to make the parrot, there are two side pieces like this one and the top part where you sit. But the rocking parrot also needs some smaller pieces like the eyes and a beak <laughs> and the wings. But the wings look a little plain, don't they? Tony is doing something called airbrushing to finish off the wings. The airbrush sucks up paint through a tube into the nozzle. Then air is blown through the nozzle to push paint out the end in a fine mist. Tony now glues the smaller pieces onto the parrot's body. It's really starting to look like a parrot now. And then all the pieces are sewn together. Now the parrot is ready for the next stage. Thank you. Colin's turning the parrot cover the right way out. Do you remember what we need next? That's right, it's the foam. But which bit of foam should we use for the rocking parrot? Hmm. This one. It's nice and squishy. All Colin has to do now is put the foam inside the cover. It's a bit of a squeeze. And there we go, one finished parrot. It looks great, doesn't it? Ready for someone to play on. What was your favourite bit about seeing how soft play items are made? Do you remember the name of the material used to stuff the floor pad in parrot? That's right, it's called foam. Did you hear the sound of the scissors as they cut the PVC material? And did you see all the air bubbles when we looked at the phone with my special camera? So the next time you come to a soft play area like this, you'll know how it's made. And now you know how cakes work. So you can tell all your friends and family about the chemical reaction that happens inside the cake to make it rise. See you next time. <laughs>